Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening. I'm Rajan Dravel representing uh, Ibipsa Education Activities and I welcome all of you to this uh, seventh session of 2019 Ibipsa Education Webinar Series, which is based on a special edition of uh, Journal of Building Performance Simulation. We have uh, Professor Ian Posilil Marison today. Uh, Ian is very active senior member of EBIPSA, has served on a various position, including president EBIPSA for several years. And he teaches and do research uh, based out of Carlton University, Canada. And I'm very happy that uh, he has agreed to spare some time with us and delivering a webinar. I have read this paper a couple of times uh, and probably I might be reading more, at least one more time thoroughly. Uh, it is very good uh, uh, learning experience while reading this paper, and I'm very glad that I'm also part of the webinar, which I'll be able to learn a little bit more. Uh, thanks, Ian, for your time, and I hand it over to you now. Okay, thank you, Rajan. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and thank you for organizing this webinar series. I think it's a it's a great service to the Abipsa community. Um, as Rajan is saying, I'm going to present on an article that appeared in the uh, the special issue of the Journal of Building Performance Simulation, and I'm focusing today on on teaching of building performance simulation. Uh, so, as mentioned, it appeared in the special issue that was recently published. A special issue that was uh, guest edited and organized by Clarice Blay de Souza and Simon Tucker from the UK. And it contained a number of articles focused on building performance simulation and the user. And the article I'm talking about today is, is from that special issue focused on, on a teaching approach that I have devised and that I use in my, uh, in my teaching at, at Carleton University. <clears throat> so I'm going to start off with uh, some provocations and some, some of you might disagree and and some of these statements are meant to cause a little bit of a, a little bit of thought or questioning about where we are as a as a community in the building performance simulation field. Um, those of us who work in in BPS and I, I have for over 30 years uh, feel that the technology has massive potential to improve the, the performance of buildings, the way we design buildings, the way we operate buildings. We have great potential to reduce energy consumption and the improve the performance of all aspects of buildings. But to a large extent, much of this potential has been unrealized. And there's many, many reasons for why building performance simulation hasn't penetrated and hasn't had as much of an impact as we think it should have. Many barriers, and some of those are, are related to the way the building professions operate, the dynamics between uh, members of design teams, the the power of in, in terms of decision making, et cetera, et cetera. But I do believe that one of the main barriers that we have for BPS having greater impact is that we, as a field, suffer a credibility gap. That simply many, many people simply don't trust building performance simulation. They don't trust the people who use simulation. They don't trust the numbers that come from these, from these tools. And I feel that the full potential of BPS can only be realized once we're, we're adequately preparing users who are applying these tools to use them effectively. And I believe that as a community, we need to do a much better job at training existing users of, of tools and educating future users of tools. So I've been training professionals and teaching university students building performance simulation for well over 20 years now. And uh, I'm convinced that I can teach just about anybody to uh, how to operate just about any simulation tool with about one day of training. And this picture is a bit of an exaggeration. I don't think I could do it for a newborn, but I think it's quite possible to train someone to push all the right buttons, to pull all the right cranks so that the simulation tool can produce some numbers and we can get to that point very quickly. With a lot of the modern BPS tools, they're quite easy to operate. The interfaces are fairly intuitive. We can input enough data to run a simulation and produce some numbers quite easily. But getting accurate results is very difficult. And getting somebody to the point where they are able to effectively operate a BPS tool is a very different question than training them on how to, how to push the buttons and produce numbers. And I'd like to give you some examples of this. 
Now, these are some results from students that I've taught in my in my university course, and uh, each one of these students here has produced a simulation result uh, using a fairly complex or difficult to use simulation tool in the matter of about three weeks from the very start of the of the semester when they were first exposed to the tools. And what we're seeing here is the students were given a, a detailed spec and drawings on a very simple building, and they had to predict the annual space heating load and the annual space cooling load. And all of these students were able to produce numbers very quickly. Um, and what we can see here is the spread in the results and the dashed lines represent where we expect the result to lie. And you can see many, many of the students' predictions are outside of that range. And that's not a surprise. These are, these are brand new users. They're just learning simulations. So it's, um, it's not a criticism of these individual students, but it's showing you that it's very easy to learn how to operate these tools, not so easy to produce accurate results. Now you might say, well, these are students, these are novices, we expect their results to be all over the map. Maybe I didn't do a good job training them, you might think. Uh, so no surprise there. But let's look at some other examples that we can find in the literature. This is a paper, Guillaume, from uh, a building simulation conference 20 some years ago, where they took a common simulation tool. They took 12 users. Some of them were very experienced users. Some of them were uh, relatively new users, but all trained, all experienced at using the tool. And they were given a set of plans and drawings for a, for a building, a common building, and they were asked to predict the annual space heating load. And there was quite a significant difference in the results produced by these users. In some cases, some users were predicting twice as much energy consumption as, as others. And the authors went through the input files and found a lot of common errors were made, uh, issues with uh, ventilation, windows, thermal bridging, uh, the way solar fluxes were distributed, the way internal surface convection was handled, a lot of errors from each one of these users. And interestingly, they found that the most experienced users had results that were no more accurate than the least experienced users. Here's another example again from uh, Berkeley et al. from a study done in, in the US a number of years ago. And again, they took 12 BPS users. In this case, these were all professionals, people who earned their living using BPS. They were all using the same simulation tool and all given a common set of plans and specifications. And they were asked to predict the monthly gas consumption and electricity consumption of this building. And you can see on these two graphs here, the one on the left is the, uh, the gas consumption and the one on the right, the electricity consumption. How each line on these graphs represents the results from a single user. And the darker yellow line here represents where the authors expected the building's performance to be. And you can see quite a spread in results between these individual users. And keep in mind, these are not novice users. These are people who earn their living, partially at least earn their living by conducting building performance simulation work. Another example, um, Strachan et al. from a couple of years ago, three years ago, this was an IEA project um, where a research house at Fraunhofer Institute was operated, uh, detailed drawings and specifications provided by to all the users, 21 individual teams, they used various simulation tools, not a common tool in this case, and they were asked to predict a few different aspects of performance. And one of them was to predict the rate of heat input to maintain uh, a set point temperature inside the space. And what you can see over this time period, each of these the lines on these graphs represent individual predictions um, of the users and the dark line is the measured performance. So in an ideal world, all of the users would be predicting and matching the measured performance. And you can see many of them do, but there were a number of predictions that were quite far off from the measurements. And as part of this IEA project, when they dug into it, they found that there were some, there were some data input errors by some of the users. Uh, there were some, some users took different assumptions, took different modeling approaches for different heat and mass transfer processes. And as a result, we can see these, these predictions were, there was quite a bit of spread in it. And I think this is consistent with the earlier results I showed uh, of, of the other cases in that we can see that it's quite challenging to produce accurate results from BPS tools. And why is that? Well, 
buildings are complex entities and so is building performance simulation. Really what we're trying to do is predict the performance of a complex entity where we have many, many different heat and mass transfer processes happening concurrently. And we somehow have to make decisions as users as to how do we represent all of the important ones, all of the significant ones for that particular case. And furthermore, how do we provide sufficient data to adequately characterize all those heat and mass transfer processes? And that can be fairly overwhelming when we think about everything we have to deal with solar radiation, direct solar radiation, ground reflected solar radiation, sky diffuse radiation, how we distribute solar radiation within the space. Think about the convective heat transfer happening at exterior surfaces, interior surfaces, wind driven air infiltration, long wave radiation exchange between all the surfaces. I mean, it's, it's a, a very large number of heat and mass transfer processes that we have to consider. And it's very easy for users to feel overwhelmed by all of this. Now, Many simulation tools provide default methods for treating some of these, these heat transfer paths and sometimes default inputs as well. And sometimes as users, we can take shortcuts and just say, let's just take the program default method. Let's take the program default input and run with that. But that might not very well represent the reality that we're trying to simulate. And in many cases, we're not equipping users to understand what are those default methods, what are the default inputs that their tool is using. And in many cases, the users aren't equipped with the sufficient knowledge that they can make choices between optional modeling methods and understand the implications of accepting default methods, et cetera. So I believe that when we prepare users to to apply building performance simulation tools, we really need to teach the fundamentals. It's important that we communicate, we make them aware of all of the fundamental processes that are happening and how those are represented in their chosen building performance simulation tools. So we really need to get underneath the hood and understand, look at, look at uh, the models that are being used, what are the inherent simplifications of those models, what are the implications of default models versus optional models? Where, where do we have optional models? Uh, where are my choices as a user going to have the greatest impact? Is changing or accurately characterizing the solar absorptivity of an exterior material more important than accurately characterizing the solar absorptivity of an interior material? We need to equip users with the knowledge that they can make those kinds of decisions. So what I've developed in my university teaching is an approach that's based on experiential learning. So it's you, I, I feel strongly that people need to use BPS, they need to apply BPS tools, they need to understand how to do that, but they can't do that in isolation from the theory. So it's really teaching theory and application in parallel concurrently. And the study of one of these is enhancing the other. So uh, the method involves four interrelated modes of learning. And if you look at topic one on the left here, that's showing the, the four individual modes of learning, studying theory, performing exercises. These are guided exercises using a BPS tool. And then an autopsy, which is really dissecting and pulling apart the results produced by students pulling apart what's happening inside the simulation program and trying to connect the application with the theory. And then the reflect and connect is where the students are, are reflecting upon all of the learnings from the theory and the application and the autopsy and relating, relating the application back to theory, relating the theory to future applications. So for each topic that I teach, I run through these four separate modes of learning that are run run concurrently and they're supporting each other and after conducting those four modes for a given topic we then move on to the next topic and then repeat that cycle again with those four modes of learning in the next topic so this forms what i call a, a learning spiral where you can see um, here's the start of the course right here where we have those four interrelated mode, studying some theory, applying the simulation through an exercise, doing an autopsy, reflecting and connecting, going through that those four modes, and then going into a series of other iterations through those modes of learning. And these 
first iterations are focusing on heat and mass transfer processes that are pertinent to the indoor environment. And then we look at the exterior environment. And then we look at uh, processes happening through the building envelope. And this involves 15 individual iterations through this cycle. And each one of them is guided, supported by, by theory and interaction with the instructor. And by the time we finish these 15 modes, we've now studied all of the most relevant heat and mass transfer processes re related to the building form and fabric. And now the students, by this point, should have a good understanding of how to operate the chosen building performance simulation tool. They should have a good understanding of the theoretical underpinnings, the modeling methods used, the optional modeling methods available. And at this point, they're given a more challenging exercise, and that's the outer ring on this, this spiral that again involves the, the modes of learning. And I call this the culminating trial, where they, they take all of this learning and now they apply it to a real building, an actual building. And they have to now make many decisions about which models to use, which optional models to use, which input data they really need to accurately characterize, which other ones they can approximate or accept defaults. And they now have to predict the performance of that actual building. And we'll come back to that in a few minutes. So in terms of the organizational structure of the course, um, as I mentioned, I've broken this up into looking at all of the individual heat and mass transfer processes in isolation, so one at a time, and then showing how they're interconnected. So we start off by focusing on what happens inside the building, the indoor environment. So looking at internal surface convection, long wave radiation exchange between individual surfaces, how solar gains that have passed through the window are distributed to individual surfaces, internal math, uh, heat and moisture sources, et cetera. After exhausting the heat and mass transfer processes related to the indoor environment, we turn our attention to the outdoor environment and look at all of the heat and mass transfer processes that are happening on the outside of the building. And then finally, we look at heat and mass transfer processes through the building envelope. So the course I, I deliver, this is a, a graduate level course for masters and PhD students, a semester long course um, with 37 hours of contact time to give you an idea. Um, there are 15 individual topics that are listed in this, in this table. And for each one of these topics, we study some theory and I'll show you the, the approaches I use. The students conduct a simulation exercise, and then we do collectively do an autopsy for each one of these, these topics. So in terms of <clears throat> studying theory, um, I use fairly conventional methods for communicating the theory. So uh, I provide students some course notes and some text that are handed out to them before they come to a lecture. So they do some reading, maybe five to 10 pages that describes the, the structure of models that are used for that heat and mass transfer process that we're focusing on, uh, provide some equations. And I do this in a tool agnostic way. So I'm not focusing on any one particular simulation tool. I'm trying to show the methods that are state of the art methods that are used in many of the existing simulation tools. So we get into some equations, but the equations are only there when necessary to, to communicate for the students to really understand the, the fundamentals. Uh, those course notes and readings are, are enhanced by a, a lecture. So we have a lecture together. I try not to spend too much time talking, but we go through parts of the, um, the theory that might be a little bit more challenging to understand, and we elaborate on some of that. Uh, there are assigned readings. So for each uh, most topics, there's one or two assigned readings, maybe a journal article or a portion of a journal article or a conference paper that focuses on something relevant to that heat and mass transfer process. And we have discussions of those in class. And then I also use some in-class quizzes. And there's a couple of examples shown off on the right-hand side where I'm, uh, these are questions that will pop up during a lecture time and the students will have to answer these using uh, an app on their mobile phone that will really test their understanding of what they've read from the assigned readings or from the course, course notes that were handed out. And then they get instant feedback and I as an instructor get instant feedback so I can see if, if a certain concept wasn't 
well understood by the majority, I can spend a little bit more time focusing on that. So in terms of the theory, we yeah, we have to get into theory. We, we get into the math. We understand how heat and mass transfer uh, balances are formed. So for example, here we're looking at, uh, we show the, the terms that are formed in the, the uh, heat balance that is formed at interior surfaces of the building. So the students see all of the terms that are considered. And then we're focusing right now on how solar energy that has passed through the windows is being absorbed on individual surfaces. And then, so I show the terms that appear in those energy balances and, and that term and, you can, and the students see right away, well, there's only three parameters that appear, three variables that appear in that equation. There's the area and that comes from the geometrical input. So they understand, okay, well, that's, that's what my geometrical input is being used for in part. Here's a solar absorptivity, which is either given by the user or the user has chosen a material from a program database that has a solar absorptivity associated with it. So that influences that term that influences then this energy balance. And then the third term is, is the uh, solar radi radiance that is incident upon any given surface. And then we say, well, there's models that predict that. And then we talk about the models that are used to predict that term by the, the various models that, that are available in simulation tools and sometimes the optional models that might be available. Um, likewise, when we talk about long wave radiation exchange between internal surfaces, I'll show them the method that would be used to calculate a linearized radiation coefficient that would subsequently appear in an internal surface energy balance. And we don't have to worry so much about all the details in here, about all the interreflections, et cetera, but the students can see right away the terms that appear in here are areas. Again, this is from the geometrical input that's provided to the tool. These are emissivities, long wave emissivities or infrared emissivities that the user either provides directly or they select a material from a database that has a default emissivity associated with it. So they can see right away, well, that's gonna impact my calculation, my radiation coefficient, and that's gonna impact now the internal surface energy balance. And then they see, well, there's view factors as well. And where do these view factors come from? Well, that leads into a discussion now about what are the methods that are used by simulation tools for estimating or calculating view factors? What are the default methods and what are the optional methods? So that theory on its own is interesting, but it doesn't really mean much until you start applying the tools. And sometimes students don't really appreciate why the theory is important until they start applying. And this is where I think the benefit of the experiential learning comes in. As I mentioned before, there's uh, simulation exercises. I've developed 15 of these. So there's one for each of the, the topics of the course. And each exercise is really guiding the students through using a simulation tool to explore one particular heat or mass transfer process. These exercises are written in, in a tool agnostic fashion. I use two different simulation tools in, in my teaching, but they, uh, they can be used for, for just about any simulation tool. They're written in a generic fashion. And I'm really guiding the students now to use the simulation tool, explore it. Uh, in many cases, they'll have to go back and understand the technical documentation that comes with their simulation tool. They'll have to dig a little bit. They'll have to understand what are the models that are used by their tool. Um, I support this learning by video sequences that I post on a learning management system. And this is really just so that to give the students enough information so they know how to operate the tool, but I'm not giving them detailed instructions on which buttons to push. They just, it's just general operational sequences. So this really forces, doing the exercise forces the students to learn. And they realize that there's, there's lots of material out there for the, the given simulation tools and they explore that information and they come back and they produce some results. So here's an example of uh, the very first simulation exercise that I call the base case, where it's a simple shoebox, just a, just a rectangular single zone building with a single, a single window. And there's de detailed geometrical specifications and then all of the thermophysical properties of all of the, the materials that make up the building envelope all of the uh, optical properties for all the glass layers are all provided. So there's a complete specification so that um, the students at this point don't have to take any decisions about use of optional methods. It's very, very straightforward, but this forces them now to go through the learning process. 
most of the students, when they take this course, they've never used a building performance simulation tool before, and, and rarely have they used uh, one of the tools I'm using in the course. So they're all brand new. And within three weeks, they have to predict the performance of this building with two separate simulation tools that they're, they're learning. So this is a very intense period for them to build up that first simulation exercise. And then subsequent exercises are, for the most part, variants on this simple base case. So uh, this, these are the multiple steps involved in the simulation exercise that's focusing on the solar radiation to exterior building surfaces. So uh, again, we're trying to isolate an individual heat transfer process here. So we look at what are the impacts of user input what are the impacts of modeling choices made by the user upon simulation predictions? So in the first step, we're changing, we're simply making one change from the base case. We're changing the solar absorptivity of the asphalt shingles that make up the roof of that building. And then we're comparing the results to the base case. In the second step, we're looking at what are the available methods in, in the simulation tool for treating sky diffuse radiation? for predicting sky diffuse radiation and running simulations with those optional methods to see what impact that has. In step three, we're looking at how significant is ground reflected radiation? What if we change the ground reflectivity of the albedo from uh, the tool default method to a prescribed value? And we're looking at the impact of that result. So most of the exercises after the first one are, are structured like this, where there's small changes made and in most cases, the students can run these simulations fairly quickly. It's very guided that way. So for these, each of these exercises, the students are they're performing their simulation exercise. That makes them relate back to the theory that they've just studied, and they're producing some results. And now they submit those results to, to me as an instructor. And then we come together and we conduct the next uh, mode of learning together, which is an autopsy. We call it an autopsy because it's uh, um, the ideas that we're pulling apart, we're dissecting the simulations that were conducted by the students, and we're dissecting in some degree the simulation tools to really understand the theory, to understand the default methods, to understand the optional methods in those tools. So these are instructor-led sessions. The students submit all their results to me, and then I, I graph them together, and we come together in the next class, and we look at those results all together. And it's really a collective learning. There's a lot of discussion and interaction happening at, at this point in time, lots of discussions. And this is, this is one of the aspects of the course that the students find the most valuable, the most engaging, and uh, they consistently rate this as the, the most important or one of the most important modes of learning uh, in, their, in the course. And we try to scrutinize results. We ask ourselves questions that these results make sense. And then invariably there's some, some issues. Some, maybe some students' predictions are very different than other students' predictions. And we try to diagnose these issues. And in many cases, students are asked to come to the front of the class and they load up their simulation input files. And we look at those together and we try to understand why does student A have a very different result than student B than a different result than student C. So here's, for example, the, uh, the results that come in for the base case. This is the very first uh, simulation predictions three weeks after the course began. And uh, you can see most of the students were able within the three week period to produce simulation results with a tool that most of them had never seen before. And now they're predicting here the annual space heating load for that base case. These are the results that they're submitted. I graph them up, we come together and I put this graph up on the screen and we all say, okay, why is, why is student B uh, have a very low prediction of, of uh, space heating where student C has a much higher prediction and student M, well, that was, that was off, off the scale. And we try to ask questions now. We have some discussion about different methods that people took. What are the barriers that people ran into? And then invariably we open up some of these simulation input files and try, try to diagnose and understand why we have these predictive differences. Uh, so I expect this kind of scatter at the first in the first instance. But after that autopsy session, the students go back and they reflect upon what they learned from the autopsy. The, um, maybe their individual simulation inputs weren't diagnosed in that session, but they learned something from, from somebody else's experience. And they go back and they revise some of their inputs. They run new simulations 
and then we get results that are tend to be in closer agreement. This is after they reflect and connect and, and put everything together and, and rerun the simulations. Now, we still have some spread here. We still have some differences that we continue to diagnose as the, as the course goes on, but a much closer agreement after that, that first autopsy. So as I mentioned, each topic has its own autopsy. The simulation uh, exercises are conducted by the students. They submit the results. I graph them. We get together and look at them. And we learn from that. So here's, here's a case where, uh, again, we're looking at the annual space heating load. And this is the exercise that, fo that is focused on the modeling of solar radiance to interior surfaces of the building. And we're seeing in this first step of the exercise that the solar absorptivity of the interior surface of the floor was increased by a significant amount. And the students, you know, think back to the theory and they say, okay, well, if, if the solar absorptivity is increased, thinking back to that equation we saw earlier, that means there's more solar energy absorbed to the floor. That's going to influence now the energy balance for that interior surfaces. I expect to see some kind of difference. But what we plot up here is we see that for each student, we have the base case result in blue. And then the second simulation where in step one, where they increase the floor solar absorptivity. And we can see for student A, well, very little impact on the annual space heating load. Same thing for student B and so on. Although we have differences between the students, for each student, we see very little impact of increasing that floor absorptivity. So then we collectively ask the question, well, why, why is that? What's going on here? Is there something wrong with the simulation program? Is there something wrong with our understanding? What, what's happening with that energy balance? So we go back and look at the energy balance again, and we say, okay, here's the term in the energy balance. We've increased this solar absorptivity uh, by a significant amount. That's going to increase the solar radiation absorbed. That's what we expect. So here's the graph. We looked at one student's results here for a particular day. Here's the, the base case. And then in blue, we see what happens in terms of the amount of solar energy that's absorbed on the floor when we increase the absorptivity. And, and we see, yeah, well, sure enough, there, there was a big increase in solar absorption. That makes sense. But then this, these two series here are plotting now what the HVAC system is doing in terms of heat injection to maintain the space. So that big change in the solar absorption on the floor had negligible impact on the HVAC system. So then we go back and look at the energy balances and try to understand why, why is it that? What happened in this case? And then through discussion and, and uh, looking back at the equations, we all realize now that this is a well-insulated building. And what's happening when the more solar energy is being absorbed on that floor surface, it means less energy is being absorbed on the other surfaces. All of the surfaces have more or less the same insulation so that the impact on the building space heating load becomes negligible. And that's a very important lesson for the students because they realize, well, that's, that solar absorptivity is not a parameter that's easy to come by in many cases. If we're simulating a building, we don't really know what the solar absorptivity of the floor tiles are or the wood floor or the solar absorptivity of the painted gypsum board making up the walls. And that's showing them that for certain types of buildings like this one, that parameter has very little impact on simulation predictions, at least in terms of predicting space heating load. So that's something that they, they store away in, their, in their, uh, their minds and that they'll draw upon when they come to the final simulation exercise. Um, I, I mentioned I use two simulation tools in my teaching and I do that because the, the models that are used by the two tools can be quite different. And it's important, I think, for the students to appreciate that, that within the building performance simulation field, we have developed different modeling methods and it's important to understand what those different approaches are, what the strengths and weaknesses of, of each method are. So in conducting this exercise on internal solar, uh, one of the students realized when we were looking at the results from the two tools that one tool was predicting a much higher solar absorption by the floor, tool B here, than tool A. And they questioned, why, why is that? What's going on with this model? And then we did another exercise where instead of accepting the tool default method for predicting how that solar energy gets distributed to the floor, to the internal surfaces, they invoked optional methods in each tool. And here's tool A where we have the default method and then the optional method, which is very different. And then tool B, the default and optional methods were very close together. 
and that led into a discussion about what are the default methods used by the two tools and and uh, really understanding the models that are implemented in the tool, two tools, the default methods and the optional methods that, that are available. They also see through these autopsies um, and these simulation exercises that progress throughout the semester that some of the inputs that they're dealing with have much greater impact than another. The graph on the left is the one we just saw where we saw that the students realized that changing the solar absorptivity of the interior surfaces of the floor had negligible impact on space heating loads. Whereas um, if we're looking now at space cooling load on the right, this is changing the solar absorptivity of the exterior surface of a roof. And they're seeing now in, in many of their predictions a much more significant impact. And they realize now that if they're dealing with limited time on a project, which is always the case, if they have to dig and find out solar absorptivities of materials, they should focus more on the materials making up the exterior of the building rather than the interior of the building. All right, so throughout the, the semester, we go through these, these exercises. I mentioned there's 15 iterations through this learning cycle, and we, and we focus first on the in, indoor environment, and then the heat mass transfer process is relative, relevant to the exterior environment, and then what goes on within the building envelope. And then we put it all together in this culminating trial. And at this point, the students now have to, it's a less guided approach. They now have to predict the performance of an actual building. They have to put together all of that learning throughout this semester. So this is a, a research house on our campus. And I provide the students with detailed plans and specifications. And they probably get more information than they would in a typical professional practice in terms of understanding the types of materials in here, but they don't have complete information. They have to do some digging and make some decisions, figure out, for example, what's the solar absorptivity of this uh, aging cedar on that makes up the outside of the building envelope. What's the, what are the optical properties of the sheets of glass that make up that glazing system? Uh, what's the reflectivity, how are they going to treat the reflectivity of the snow-covered ground surrounding the building, et cetera, et cetera. They have to make all of these decisions now independently. So I give them the detailed drawings and specs. And in this instance that I'm highlighting in the paper, I gave them uh, weather data for a one-week period in March. This was from a couple of years ago. Uh, each, year, each year I deliver the course, I give them a different, uh, different series of time and weather data. But they have details of the weather data. We're measuring weather data on site. So they have uh, really no uncertainty in the weather data. They've got wind speeds, ambient temperatures, relative humidities, uh, solar radiance, et cetera. This is a one week period that they're asked to predict. And uh, it was an interesting period because we had, it was relatively cold. We had uh, temperatures up to zero, temperatures down to minus 20. Um, most of the days were quite sunny. The blue dots here are showing high solar radiance on most days and then a couple of cloudy days. So they had, and then they had some days where the temperatures were rapidly dropping, going from you know, minus three down to minus 20 in the course of the day. So they had an interesting combination of weather conditions. The students had to now decide how they're going to thermally zone that building. How are they going to represent the interior spaces of the building? Where are they going to get all the input data that they need? And which optional methods are they going to are they going to employ from the, the simulation tool that they're applying? So they go away and they come back with their predictions. And again, we do a final autopsy. They submit all of their predictions and then I graph them up and then we get together for an autopsy session and we collectively examine them. And I'm showing here now a small subset of the results that, that the students produce and that we look at. Here's the one over the one week period. This The uh, gray line here is the measured indoor air temperature on the main floor of the house. And this is one of the parameters that they're asked to predict. They're asked to predict the peak temperature over that one week period and that each of these green dots represents one student's prediction of the peak temperature, the magnitude, and then the timing. And then we're comparing that to, uh, to the measurements and we're asking questions, well, why do, why do some students, for example, predict the peak temperature on different days and we, we diagnose reasons for why that's happening. And, and the objective of, of diagnosing this is not to shame and blame a student, but it's really so that we can all learn from that experience. So we had students 
like A, for example, that we realized or he, or he or she realized during the autopsy that they actually applied the wrong weather file. They used the default weather file for their simulation tool rather than the measured weather file that was provided. Um, student B had significantly underpredicted the peak heating load and realized during the autopsy that they used the wrong optical properties um, for the for the window. Student C had the building facing in the wrong direction rather than the windows south facing they were north facing. Students D and E were significantly over predicting the peak temperatures and their results are shown for a different day over here on the right hand side and we can see that their their indoor air temperatures respond much more rapidly to a solar input, a passive solar input than the measured results. And when we diagnose their cases, we realized collectively again that um, they had neglected to include a lot of the interior partition walls and the thermal mass of a lot of the interior partition walls that meant that the passive solar gains that were coming into the building in their simulations were causing a much more rapid increase in temperature because there was just le less thermal mass there. So we spent a lot of time on that final autopsy and again that's that's really meant so that the students learn and when they leave that final autopsy they do the reflect and connect and many of them are will go back and revise their inputs and improve their simulation predictions. So that's a very rapid tour through um, the approaches that I've devised for, for teaching BPS. And again, this is a, a semester long graduate level course. Um, it's very much based on an experiential learning approach, which I think is, is critical that studying the theory without applying the tools and without the autopsy where we dissect the results is, um, is is just not that valuable the the method includes four interrelated modes of learning and they're all critical pulling any one of them out would uh, would cause a significant loss in the learning uh, involved I, I always ask the students at the end of the semester give me feedback and and evaluate the different aspects of the course and they consistently rate that the simulation exercises the autopsies and the, the culminating trial as being absolutely key to their learning and it is learning intensive. I know that the students spend a lot of time on this course, but they, they all say that they learn a great deal from it as well. Uh, so all those materials are, are developed, uh, 15 individual simulation exercises. Now it's very much focused on the heat and mass transfer processes relevant to the form and fabric of the building. And that's just a matter of scope. It doesn't include HVAC, it doesn't include lighting and acoustics and details of air flows. Uh, and that's really just because of, of time, but the technique could be expanded to consider those other domains. And uh, to reiterate what I said earlier, that I think understanding the fundamentals is absolutely critical for BPS users and is very critical, I think, for us as a field if the users that we're putting out there that are applying these tools have to understand those fundamentals for the field to gain the credibility. And with that, I'd, I'd like to conclude and I'd be happy to, to take any questions. Thanks, uh, Ian. Uh, this is wonderful, and it's very nice to hear you uh, again uh, talking about education and the kind of uh, activities you do at your university. Uh, I have uh, probably one question coming from um, that. In fact, the two or three questions already has come up. So, uh, one first question coming from person called Eloises D. Cruz and the question is how do you manage time between coding details and underlying building physics? Hmm. So in terms of um, how do I manage the time between understanding the models versus the building physics? Hmm. So all of the students taking this course are um, masters or PhD students in engineering, or uh, I've had a couple of architects, maybe one architect in the past. Um, most of them are entering the course with a pretty good understanding of heat transfer and fluid mechanics, thermodynamics, but not that strong an understanding of building physics. So uh, I have to spend a little bit of time discussing how the, the fundamentals they understand about heat transfer fluids and thermodynamics apply to buildings. Um, but I think 
most of the time I do spend is on the modeling aspects, the models that are used in the building simulation tools. And if students are struggling a little bit with the building physics, I give them some pointers to outside resources that, that, that they turn to. But I think understanding, to really understand the models, it's critical that the students have a good understanding of, of the fundamentals of heat transfer, fluids and thermal, but not so much the building physics, that comes fairly quickly. Thanks. Uh, we have a couple of questions in uh, from having a similar nature. And let me sort of repeat on behalf of all of them. Uh, they're asking basically about the selection of a BPS tool. Um, so which one do you really use uh, while uh, helping them understand the building physics and systems together. Uh, another person having similar questions that have you got many problems with CanQuest while well, we are using CanQuest. Another person is asking about, um, uh, yeah, which particular model, uh, which particular tool you use. So if you can reflect upon that. There are four or five questions having okay. a similar kind of nature. Yeah. Yeah. So I try to keep the, the teaching of this, this course to be tool agnostic. And I'm really focusing on the fundamentals of building performance simulation. What kind of models could be used? So I'm not, I'm not, uh, it's not a software training course where I'm focusing on a particular tool. Now I use two tools in my teaching. Um, and I've chosen to use Energy Plus and ESPR uh, because of the rigor of these two tools in terms of representing the building physics. Um, and also because these two tools have very good technical documentation associated with them so that um, I want the students to, to, to really understand the methods and, and they're both very appropriate tools for doing that. They also have the two tools that have um, for many of the heat and mass transfer processes, they support optional modeling methods. And that information is, is readily available. So that's why I focus on these two tools, but um, really what I'm trying to do is equip people with the understanding of the fundamentals so that once they have this, this knowledge, they can pick up any tool, whether it's eQuest or, or Visual Studio or uh, Design Builder or anything like that, and learn how to operate that tool very quickly. Learning to operate the tool is a quick thing. Understanding the fundamentals is not, but but once they have the understanding of the fundamentals, they can they can learn how to apply that to another tool very easily. So I, I use Energy Plus and, and uh, ESPR, but I think this this approach could be used with with any simulation tool. Thanks. Uh, we have a question from uh, Vishal Garg. Vishal, uh, I'm unmuting you. Do you have a microphone or headphone? Would you like to ask question directly? Yeah. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah. Uh, so uh, thank you, Anne, for such a wonderful uh, presentation. And uh, the, uh, the method that you have explained is quite intensive so you have to work a lot with the students and a lot of contact hours uh, i'm just thinking how this can be scaled and is it possible to bring such kind of teaching onto a MOOC platform mm -hmm. yeah that's a good question um it is quite intensive but i've developed techniques over the years to minimize um that intensity so for example the uh, the the autopsies are a very important part of the learning and the students have to submit the results. Now I've written a number of, of scripts that will take the results. The students submit the results in Excel files, but in a prescribed format. And I have scripts that I don't even have to open up the Excel files. The scripts just pull the numbers out of the, the cells of the Excel file and they populate those into graphs automatically. So sometimes the amount of effort for me to prepare an autopsy is only about one or two hours of my time. Um, so that can be streamlined in, in certain ways. In terms of making this an online approach, that's a very interesting question and I've thought about it and I'm not sure that I have an answer on how to do that because I think the interaction is very important, uh, particularly when it comes to autopsy. So if this were to be done as an online, I think it would have to be a structured online with a fixed schedule where 
where the students are, are supplying their exercise results on a fixed schedule and an instructor is still going through the autopsy but doing it in a, uh, through an online live session somehow. Um, in terms of, of scaling, uh, just to give you an idea, the class size that I'm dealing with is typically about 15 to 20 students, so it's relatively small class sizes. That's a, a typical class size for a graduate level course at our university. Thank you. Um, just a follow-up question, if I'm audible. You are audible. Okay. So, uh, Ian, is it possible to have some kind of a peer learning groups and uh, the students discuss with each other their results and try to find out uh, why some of the results are correct and some of them are not correct and mm -hmm. some kind of peer learning can be introduced in this whole process? Yeah, that's a very interesting, um, very interesting point. Um, the simulation autopsies that I described are, although they're instructor led, a lot of the learning happens between students. So a lot of the discussion is student led in those sessions. So uh, I'm there as an instructor to facilitate that, but but in many cases, it's one student talking about the methods they use and trying to explain the results they had and other students learning from those contributions. And I, I'm encouraging the students to contribute as much as possible. Could you do it in a peer learning group uh, without an instructor? I'm not sure if that, how, to, how to make that happen, but that's, a, that's an, interesting, uh, an interesting idea that would be worth thinking about. Thank you. We have a question from Tarek Ahmed. Tarek, I have unmuted you if you wish to ask questions directly. Oh, oh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. can. Oh, great. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Ian. Um, just have a quick question. Like, um, I'm from an academic background. I just wanted to know uh, if your approach would differ if you teach it at undergraduate level, and is it actually worth it? to teach at that level for students and would you use a different teaching approach if you teach an, um, a cohort from our architecture background? Mm, okay, so good questions. Um, I think whether, whether you could teach this at an undergrad level would depend very much on the, um, the program at your university. Uh, in the Canadian system where I'm working, the undergrad program is a it's a four-year undergrad program and the students are really focusing more on on the fundamentals so they've had courses on heat transfer and thermodynamics and fluid mechanics and materials and many other aspects um, they really only have just acquired sufficient knowledge of those fundamentals by the time they get to the the last part of their final year to be to have the prerequisite knowledge for this course so i think it would be hard at least in my institution, to teach this at an undergrad level. But I think in some academic programs, it might be possible as long as the, the students have acquired that sufficient um, prerequisite knowledge before they get to their final year. Um, I mentioned I did have a, an architectural student in my course once. Um, she was quite strong technically, uh, but she didn't have the background in heat transfer. And I gave her some guidance in terms of what she needed to learn to have the prerequisite knowledge. And she self-studied uh, before the, the academic term began so that she was prepared to, to do well in the course. And she certainly acquired all that prerequisite knowledge in time and excelled once she got to this course. Um, but I think, again, it depends very much on the architectural program. Uh, at some universities, the architectural program is not as strong in technical aspects as in other universities. They would need to have sufficient uh, technical knowledge. And I think if I were to teach this to a group of architects, I would probably adapt it a little bit and take out some of the math and try to explain things in a little bit in a different way, I think. Thanks. Uh, we have a Simon. I have unmuted you. Uh, if you can use your microphone, can you hear me? We have a question. From, yes, we can. Thanks for the talk, Ian. Um, do the students improve their performance as you go through all those cycles? Because there are quite a lot of cycles there. Mm, yes. 
do, do they get nearer to the control simulation as you progress through the course? Yeah, yeah, so it's a good question. So for um, for each iteration through the cycle, they're learning something, and, and most of the students are continuously approving the representation of the base case because they're always learning something in those cycles. So the, the results tend to converge. Now, there's always a, still a, a couple of outliers, but the results get much closer together. Now, for those, uh, most of those simulation exercises, we're simulating the performance of a hypothetical building. So we don't really know what the performance is. It's just a, it's just a box with a window. Um, I simulate them myself, and I will show the students my results after a period of time, but not, not because that's the, the target. That's just my result. Um, but I would say most students get quite close as, as the course progresses. The, the results tend to converge. Okay, thanks. But it is really interesting at the very culminating trial to see um, we often do have a spread in results and normally it's due to different decisions the students make um, and they learn a great deal actually from each other because they have differences in their results. It would be interesting to see a paper on the the feedback aspect of it, you know, the, this sort of change in results as well as the yes. description of the uh, method that you're using. Yes, that's that would be very interesting. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Rajan, are you still there? Yes, uh, I'm here. So there are a couple of questions on fact, more than that uh, people are asking about the presentation copy of it so I want to inform those who are here that we are recording this presentation and uh, if the quality is suitable we will be posting this on Ibipsa University uh, uh, YouTube channel you can check it out there uh, I think the last question is from uh, my colleague Arjun who helps me to organize this and use uh, act as a backup. So Arjun, would you like to ask a question to Ian? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. A lot of background noise, but you can hear quickly. Uh, so my, my question is, uh, do the students get uh, hands-on measurement uh, training also? Because that, that becomes a very important part for students to understand uh, what sort of inputs they are giving into uh, simulations. Yes, yeah, so y your question was, do they have training on hands-on measurements? Yes. Well, in terms of uh, measuring uh, the performance of a building or measuring uh, building components? That be yeah, I mean, uh, let's talk about if, say, HVAC, so the ventilation rates or uh, you yes, talk yes, about... Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes, yeah, a good question. Um, in this course, no, I don't. I don't get into that. I'm really focused very much on the building performance simulation, and they do when they come to the culminating trial. They do have to make a lot of decisions about where they're going to get their input data from, but they're not taking measurements in that case. They have to rely on information they can find in the literature or reference books or handbooks, etc. But it, this course is not focused on the, the measurement aspects. Thanks, and I think we have a last question from Sam Elias. The question is, where can one get some data set to validate building models while learning in order to avoid garbage in, garbage out simulations? Mm. Uh, if I... Where can one get? Um, so in terms of the, the culminating trial that I showed here, we do have measured performance results on this particular building and I can make available uh, the specifications and the drawings on this building if somebody wanted to try to reproduce what those those results are that's certainly possible um, and in terms of the individual simulation exercises I'm uh, currently in the process of, of putting that together in a in a format that can be publicly distributed to make those widely available to anybody who might want to make use of these materials in, in their teaching 
Thank you. Uh, we don't have any further questions coming from uh, from the group. So let's conclude this with a note of thanks. Uh, thank you, Ian. Thanks for, again, wonderful presentation. Always okay, nice to hear you on you education. Thank you. And I, again, encourage everybody to uh, visit BS 2019, Building Civil Innovation 2019 conference website. Uh, registrations are open. You can uh, join us in Rome. It is the flagship event Ibipsha host every two years and a lot of learning, a lot of interaction. At the same time, I also want uh, to request many of you to join Ibipsha as a supporting member. Uh, and once you join as a supporting member, the JBIP journal would be complimentary or access to the JBIP journal would be complimentary from the publication. So I really encourage many of you to join Ibipsa as a supporting members. Uh, with that note, I would like to conclude and thank you all of you. Thank you, Ian. Okay, thank you.